sang two of those was so certain people could we sang two hymns in a row uh, anyway uh, <laughs> let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Acts a wonderful passage before us tonight and that's why I sang two songs about grace one right after another right in a row there because not only does the grace of God bring us salvation as scripture clearly declares but it is the grace of God that brings us through the predestined storms in our lives you're going to face some storms in your life I think there are some that are coming and the not too distant future we're over in the book of Acts we're in chapter 27 today we're looking at verses 13 through 26 Acts chapter 27 we'll be looking at verses 13 through 26 so if you have your Bibles you want to turn over to that passage and we will read those verses in just a few moments but first let's join together in prayer our gracious Heavenly Father how we thank you for the privilege of hearing your word believing your word obeying your word we couldn't do it apart from the grace of God and that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us that's grace and he's the one who has predestinated everything in our lives that we might be conformed to the image of your son that's grace and he's the one who has guaranteed us the hope of heaven that's grace father how we praise you and thank you for your grace you have forgiven us for our sins and you've given us hope for eternity marvelous grace of Jesus and so father we pray that tonight as we study your word that you will open our hearts to understand more about the grace of God in the times of testing the times of trial the times of suffering that come into the lives of every believer because you are refining us because you are purifying us because you are causing us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ thank you father for your word and we pray your blessings upon it tonight for we pray it in Jesus name amen Acts chapter 27 rather exciting passage and of course we're moving toward the book of, end of the book of Acts we're almost there and everybody will say oh I'm so glad he's going to be finishing with the book of Acts and then we can study something else after the book of Acts well you know what no matter what we study it's the Word of God and so you'll just have to wait and see what that will be we'll start down in verse 24 tonight Acts chapter 27 beginning in verse 24 I'm sorry I thought somebody said something okay never mind Acts chapter 27 and beginning in verse 13 I said verse 24 and when the south wind blew softly supposing that they had obtained their purpose loosing thence they sailed close by Crete but not long after there arose against it a tempestuous wind called Eurachlidon and when the ship was caught and could not bear up into the wind we let her drive and running under a certain island which is called Clauda we had much work to come by the boat which when they had taken up they used helps undergirding the ship and fearing lest they should fall into the quicksand strake sail and so were driven and we being exceedingly tossed with a tempest the next day they lightened the ship and the third day we cast out with our own hands the tackling of the ship and when neither sun nor stars in many days appeared and no small tempest lay on us all hope that we should be saved was then taken away but after long abstinence Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said sirs you should have hearkened unto me and not to have loosed from Crete and to have gained this harm and loss and now I exhort you to be of good cheer for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the ship for there stood by me this night the angel of God whose I am and whom I serve saying fear not Paul thou must be brought before Caesar and lo God hath given thee all them that sail with thee therefore sirs be of good cheer for I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me albeit we must be cast upon a certain island 
Amen. This morning we talked about that little phrase, fear not. Moses standing before the children of Israel, they're in the cul-de-sac. They've reached a dead end. They've got the sea behind them. They've got the mountains on either side of them. They turn around and they see Pharaoh and his chariots coming and they're terrified. Here we have another situation just like that. God often allows us, in fact, not only allows us, but directs us into those impossible situations of life where there is no escape. You caught that? Verse 20, it said, When neither sun nor stars in many days appeared, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope that we should be saved was then taken away. That's the point that God wants to bring us to, each and every one of us. The point of hopelessness, of helplessness, where we can no longer rely on our own strength, where we can no longer rely on our own intellect, where we can no longer rely on our own money, when we can no longer rely on our own talents and skills and resources and other people, because he wants us to learn to trust him. And the sooner we learn that, suddenly our life comes into the center of a calm in the center of God's will. Predestined storms in our lives. Rather an exciting passage that we're looking at tonight. You recall that the last time in, we were in Acts was back on August 28th, sailing slow after fast, and we talked about the fast. Then last week was our Patriot's Day evening special, the DVD, Remembering 9-11. That was a time of crisis also, wasn't it? We've had a couple of more attacks yesterday and the night before up in New York City. So the last time we were in Acts, we developed the sixth element in our list of eight elements that God uses in the life of every believer. So these are elements that God is going to use in your life too. Because God's design is to conform you to the image of Christ. And so these are the elements that he always uses. We talked about what is the specific will of God for your life, the destinations and the goals that God has planned for your life. So now we want to tie in the tenth of those principles. What we want to talk about is how God uses the storms in our lives to accomplish that specific will of God. God doesn't just use the good things that are in our lives. God uses the hard things, the bad things, the tough things. Quick review, the fast in our text is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. The Jews had to celebrate it on the 10th of Tishri, the seventh month of the Jewish calendar. This year it's going to be on October 12th, which is a dangerous time of the year to sail on the Mediterranean. You remember that I contrasted and compared Yom Kippur with Chab Av, the ninth day of the month of Av which is when the temple was destroyed. In fact, both the first and second temples were destroyed on that date. And we read many, many other horrible things that have happened to the Jews on that day. The one, Yom Kippur, is the Day of Atonement, which God gave as a fast to remind people of their sins so that they would repent before God. The second is a Jewish holiday established by the Jews to remember all the bad things that have happened to them. Not necessarily to repent over the bad things they've done, but just to remember and feel sorry for themselves. Quite a difference in the types of sorrow that we see. One is the sorrow that leads to repentance, and the other is the sorrow of the world, which leads to death. God's sorrow, which leads to repentance, gets us back in fellowship with him. The sorrow of the world makes us feel sorry for ourselves because bad things are happening to us. We saw that Yom Kippur was to cover all the sins that had been committed in the year that had preceded where God was dealing with his people. And the second reason we saw that it was given was a day upon which the year of Jubilee, the year of freedom, would be proclaimed. You see, when we deal with our sins the way God wants them dealt with, suddenly we come into the freedom that only God can give to us. Freedom from all that pressure. Freedom from all the burdens. Freedom from, from, from the heavy load of sin that comes down upon us. There is a jubilee. There is a release that God provides for his people. 
We saw that Yom Kippur was directly connected by God to the instructions for the Day of Atonement and the Mercy Seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant. And we saw that there were some transdispensational principles involved because that instance about the giving of the law concerning Yom Kippur is quoted in Hebrews chapter 9, verses 1 through 28. The Mercy Seat was a foreshadowing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Then we talked about the significance of the scapegoat and the Lord's goat, both of which represent different aspects of Christ. The scapegoat was driven away into the wilderness. It escaped, but all the sins were first placed on the head of that goat by the high priest. And then it was taken by the hand of an able man into the wilderness where it would never be seen again. That's what Christ does with our sins. He takes them away from us as far as the east is from the west. And then the Lord's goat was sacrificed and its blood was carried by the high priest once a year, Yom Kippur, Day of Atonement, in behind the veil in the holiest of all, the Holy of Holies, and sprinkled upon the mercy seat because the mercy seat, which the New Testament word for that is the hilasterion, that is what Jesus is called. He is called our hilasterion. He is our mercy seat. And his blood was sprinkled in the very presence of God for our sins. Beautiful pictures that were given to us there. I read you some of the horrible things that have fallen on or near the Shabbat uh, uh, and that gave our 20 questions in a proper perspective. We talked about all the different things about how we feel like we're sailing through dangerous waters. There are scary things in our lives we can't control. There are people around us making decisions that affect us, but we can't do anything about it and so on. We went through a whole list there. And then we looked at the three essentials about the will of God, principles that we always must remember when you feel that way. Number one, God can do it without you. Number two, the primary purpose in your life is to conform you to the image of Christ. That's why God brings some tough things into life that we're going to talk about tonight. And number three, God can strong arm the entire universe with precision to make sure that everything happens like the storm that came on the ship with Paul. Because it was going to affect not only Paul, but it was going to affect every passenger on that boat. It was going to affect the captain who thought he knew better. It was going to affect the Roman centurion who followed human wisdom. It was going to affect the soldiers who at the last minute when they saw the sailors about to leave the boat and Paul tells them, if they leave the boat you're lost, they cut the, the little lifeboat off and nobody had a way of escape then clearly affected the passengers, many of whom couldn't swim. It says so in the text. And they grabbed boards, and in the middle of a hurricane, every one of them made it to shore. The storms in our lives will affect not only us, but the storms in our lives will affect all those around us who see us going through the storm. How do we handle it? Are we going to handle it with panic? Are we going to be like the children of Israel that we talked about this morning? They begin to scream and complain and tell Moses they wish they had died in Egypt because there were graves in Egypt and here they are in the wilderness. And why did Moses bring them out in the wilderness? They'd rather be slaves. They panic and Moses gets mad at them and he has to tell them to sit down and quit wiggling around. He has to tell them, keep quiet. He has to tell them, open your eyes. There's a God in heaven. How are we going to respond when the storms of life hit us. God can strong arm the entire universe to bring the storm in. God can strong arm the entire universe to take the storm out. The question is, how will we respond when the storm comes into our lives? Is it your health? Is it your job? What kind of a storm is going to hit you? You don't know. The soft wind blew and they thought they had their purpose of going out to sea. Everything looked okay. And that's when the storm hit. Dear people, your Heavenly Father loves you more than you can ever imagine. He loves you with a deep, eternal, abiding love. And the storms of life are for our good. We saw that in Romans chapter 8, verses 28 and 29. 
We looked at these verses in context and saw that Paul was dealing with the will of God in much the same setting that we find here in our text. So when we feel frustrated at how slow everything's going, and then suddenly it picks up speed with intensity that we never imagined. We said, God, I'm going too slow, I'm going too slow, things are dragging along. And God says, okay, you want to go a little faster? Here's the roller coaster! <laughs> and we wish we had never asked to go faster. So that was the foundation for studying the will of God in our lives. We learned ten truths about knowing the will of God. One, certain passages tell us that we're personally responsible for doing the will of God. Number two, other passages remind us of men who clearly did the will of God, so we know it's possible. Number three, other passages tell us that we don't always know the specific will of God. We have to follow the light that God gives us, and then God gives us more light. Number four, the will of God is central to the ministry of the Holy Spirit, which he plays in our lives. Number five, specific aspects of the will of God are clearly revealed in Scripture and are tied to our moral responsibility and accountability before God. When God reveals something specific in Scripture, that means that it is the will of God. There are no ifs, ands, and buts. There are no options. There are no alternatives. It is the will of God. This is the will of God, that you should abstain from fornication. Okay, that means there are no exceptions to it. The will of God, when God says, here's a command, I want you to obey it, there are no exceptions. When he gives a prohibition, he wants you to obey it. There are no exceptions. Number six, the will of God, not the will of man, is responsible for the distribution of all of the spiritual gifts. You don't get to choose which one you've got. Number seven, the will of God underlies both our salvation and our sanctification. <laughs> and the aspect of suffering in the will of God is part of that issue of sanctification. He's burning the dross. He's burning the trash out of our lives when we go through those times. We'll see some important verses on that. Number eight, our responsibility as believers is to help fellow Christians find and live out the will of God in their lives. That's why God gives pastors and elders. That's why God gives leadership in the church, why he gives older women to train younger women. That's why he gives friends to encourage one another as iron sharpeneth iron. You have a responsibility to help fellow Christians find the will of God and to live out the will of God for their lives. The ninth principle, we saw that there are eternal blessings connected to doing, not just knowing, the will of God. And that brings us to principle number 10, which is the area we want to develop tonight in the predestined storms in our lives. The word of God guarantees that we're going to go through storms in our lives. Did you know that? It guarantees it. It doesn't say it might happen. It guarantees that we're going to go through storms in our lives. I've been through a few. I thought I'd been through a lot of pretty heavy ones. And then they get worse, and then they get worse, and then they get worse. I anticipate more. They're not just physical storms. They're things that test us. They're things that refine us for the glory of Christ. The will of God is for us to go through times of testing for the specific purpose of purifying us before sending his blessing. Now, I'm not talking about the storms that come into our lives because of our own stupidity. I'm not talking about storms that come into our lives because of our own rebellion, or our own stubbornness, or our own sloth, or our own self-willed bullheadedness. We're going to get storms in our lives because of those things. That's not what we're talking about tonight. I'm talking about suffering that comes to us when we are actually focused on doing the will of God in our lives, like Paul was doing in the passage tonight. When you suffer because you are doing the right thing. Peter talks about it in 1 Peter chapter 2. In fact, 1 Peter chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4, all of those chapters are dealing with this issue, and we're going to cover different verses out of those uh, that book tonight. But listen to 1 Peter 2.19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endures grief, suffering wrongfully. Because you have had a conscience that wants to stay right with God, if you suffer for that, 
Those are the storms in our lives that God brings and we say, Lord, this wasn't because of my stupidity. This wasn't because of my rebellion. Why am I having this storm in my life? It's, it's when you get the pain in your life and you think, Lord, I'm trying to serve you with all of my heart. Why did this hit me? Those are the storms that we want to talk about tonight. Godly men and godly leaders have suffered over and over for doing what is right. Let me give you just two examples to start with out of the Old Testament. Let's look at Nehemiah and Job. We could go through the whole book of Nehemiah, but I'll give you just one of the verses of the different oppositions and troubles and problems that Nehemiah had. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 1. It came to pass that when Sanballat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth and took great indignation and mocked the Jews. That's sort of like the first level of storms that come into our life. When people are saying bad things about us, when they're mocking us, when they're laughing at us, when they're mad at us, that's what's going on here in the passage. That's sort of a low-level storm. Level one uh, category hurricane coming in. Tropical storm, tropical depression. But you see a bigger storm is coming. Nehemiah saw a bigger storm was coming. That's why he armed the Jews and they worked with a trowel in one hand and a sword in the other hand. And they had a plan so that if the enemy attacked on a certain part of the wall, all the rest of the Jews would go because a trumpet would sound there and all the rest of them would go to that point of attack. Level one kind of a problem. Then we look at Job. Oh, there's a man who went through all the different levels, but he also experienced that first level. Job chapter 12, verse 4, I am as one mocked of his neighbor who calleth upon God and he answereth him, the just upright man is laughed to scorn. In other words, God, why in the world is this happening to me? Job has been righteous. God himself says Job is righteous. But behind the scenes, there's an angelic warfare going on. Satan and his demonic forces are busy about trying to destroy God's man. And God actually gives the devil permission to do it. God uses Satan as an instrument, not just against the wicked, but we've talked in detail about this, how God also uses Satan as an instrument of chastening his own people, sometimes not merely for what they've done wrong, but sometimes to prove a divine point that the man or the woman is righteous and will not turn their back on God. There's a certain level of spiritual maturity that comes before that attack happens. Most of us never reach there. Instead, we end up having Satan be an instrument of chastening because we've done sinful things rather than because we are examples of righteousness. You know, as you look at the Old Testament, and we're going to have to move quickly on this, but as you look at the Old Testament, all of the events of Daniel... All of the events of the captivity, all of the events of the suffering of righteous people as well as the wicked rebels of Israel, the Babylonian captivity is an example of this. The good people suffered right along with the wicked who brought on the judgment of God. Now people, that's a very practical point for us today. Our country stands on the cusp of the judgment of God. When the judgment of God falls, the righteous are going to suffer as well as the wicked. That's what's happening in the book of Daniel. In fact, we discover that is specifically stated for us as we look at the events leading up to Daniel and the wicked rulers that were ruling over Israel just prior to the captivity. I want to take you over to Second Chronicles chapter 36. I can read you about a, a, a bunch of wicked leaders and then what it says, why it happened, what God did first, and what they rejected, and that's why the judgment fell on the whole nation. We're starting for Second Chronicles 36, verse 1. Then the people of the land took Jehoahaz, the son of Josiah, and made him king in his father's stead in Jerusalem. Now you remember, jo Josiah was one of the good kings. 
The kingdom was divided at this point. The northern kingdom was called Israel. The southern kingdom was called Judah. The northern kingdom had all bad kings. Not one of the kings that are listed for uh, the northern kingdom was a good king. They were all bad. They had all gone into captivity already back uh, in 722 when the Assyrians came in and took the northern ten tribes captive. The southern two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, were the ones that were called Judah. And those are the ones that we're talking about here. Josiah was one of the good kings. And it says Jeho Jehoahaz was 20 and 3 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months in Jerusalem. And the king of Egypt put him down at Jerusalem and condemned the land in a hundred talents of silver and a talent of gold. And the king of Egypt made Eliakim, his brother, king over Judah and Jerusalem, and turned his name into Jehoiakim. And Necho took Jehoahaz, his brother, and carried him to Egypt. Jehoiakim was twenty and five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned eleven years in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God. Against him came up Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and bound him in fetters to carry him to Babylon. Nebuchadnezzar also carried of the vessels of the house of the Lord to Babylon and put them in the temple at Babylon. This is the first deportation. Now the rest of the acts of Jehoiakim, and his, remember there are three deportations, and his abominations which he did, and that which was found in him, behold, they are written in the book of the kings of Israel and Judah, and Jehoiakim, his son, reigned in his stead. Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months, and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now get that, an eight-year-old kid. You say, well, why didn't God cut him a little bit of slack? I mean, he's just a kid. Why didn't God say, well, we'll let him grow up first, and then we'll see what he does? Hmm. You know, God holds children accountable too. It doesn't matter how little you are. You say, well, I ha haven't yet reached uh, age of accountability. I haven't reached maturity. I, I haven't become an adult yet. Uh, I'm still a kid. How old was he? Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. And when the year was expired, King Nebuchadnezzar sent and brought him to Babylon with the goodly vessels of the house of the Lord and made Zedekiah his brother king over Judah and Jerusalem. Zedekiah was one and twenty years old when he began to reign and reigned eleven years in Jerusalem. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. Do you get a pattern here? King one, he did that which was evil. King two, he did that which was evil. King three, he did that which was evil. King four, he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord his God and humbled not himself before Jeremiah the prophet speaking from the mouth of the Lord. And he also rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar, who had made him swear by God, but he stiffened his neck and hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Now, there's a lot of complex theology in that particular verse. The Bible says, Blessed is the man that sweareth to his own hurt and changeth not. He had made an oath with the name of the Lord God Jehovah, that he would be a vassal of the king of Babylon. And then he decided he wasn't going to keep it. We'll have to save that for another time. He stiffened his neck, he hardened his heart from turning unto the Lord God of Israel. Moreover, all the chief of the priests and the people transgressed very much after all the abominations of the heathen and polluted the house of the Lord which he had hallowed in Jerusalem. So we have not only the political leaders, we have the religious leaders. I'm trying to set a pattern for you to understand what we're talking about. The religious leaders. And the religious leaders affected what the people believed and what the people did. Now, verse 15, key verse. And the Lord God of their fathers, God is still patiently having mercy on the land. The Lord God of their fathers sent to them by his messengers, rising up betimes and sending, because he had compassion on his people and on his dwelling place. Our country has been through a series of wicked leaders, and we find wickedness in high places in the churches and the proclamation of evil 
from the pulpits of this land and the hearts of the people, even evangelical Christians, turning to go along with what is happening in the moral decadence of our culture. It's exactly like this. God sent messengers, verse 16, but they mocked the messengers of God and despised his words and misused his prophets until the wrath of the Lord arose against his people till there was no remedy. We've talked about the point of no return. Now, were there some righteous people in the land? Yes, there were. But there came a point of no return for Judah as a nation. And the righteous people suffered with the wicked. Therefore he, that is God, brought upon them the king of the Chaldees, who slew their young men with the sword in the house of their sanctuary, and had no compassion on young man or maiden, old man, or him that stooped for age. He gave them all into his hand. You know, they killed the young warriors. He killed the old people. And he killed the teenagers, including the young girls. Is a wake-up call and all the vessels of the house of God great and small and the treasures of the house of the Lord and the treasures of the king and of his princes all these he brought to Babylon and they burnt the house of God and break down the walls of Jerusalem and burn all the palaces thereof with fire and destroyed all the goodly vessels thereof I think that someday probably I mean they destroyed the temple at Jerusalem this place will probably someday be, be destroyed or turned into something too horrible to imagine. And them that had escaped from the sword he carried away to Babylon where they were his servants to him and to his sons until the reign of the kingdom of Persia. You know who was among that? Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. We know them by their pagan Babylonian names, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those were righteous young men. They were taken to Babylon and emasculated because they were given to the hand of the prince of the eunuchs. Righteous young men. They suffered along with everybody else. They were dragged from their homes. Their parents were killed. They were taken to serve a pagan king. Predestined storms in our lives. That's what we're talking about tonight. I think that was a storm in the life of Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah. Why did it happen? Because there was another underlying root cause. Verse 21. Why did all of them go until the reign of the kingdom of Persia? It was to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah. God had sent his prophets to warn them. By the mouth of Jeremiah, until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, desolate she kept Sabbath to fulfill threescore and ten years. That's seventy years. You remember, God had told Israel that the land was to lie fallow in the seventh year. And that God would give them double increase the year before so that there would be in the sixth year, so that there would be enough food to last through the seventh year. They were to trust him. He would provide for them. They didn't have to till their land and work their land during the seventh year. It was supposed to remain fallow because God was going to provide for them. They got that sixth year and they said, well, we've got a bumper crop this year. Let's, let's go ahead and let's work the seventh year and, and we'll get even more. And boy, we will get rich. And God was watching. And God was patient. First seven years and they're working. God could have sent his judgment right then. But he waited. 
second seven years, they said, hey, we got away with it the first time. We worked during that seventh year. And God didn't do anything, so hey, we got a bumper crop in the sixth year again. Let's go to it. We're going to make more money. And the end of that seventh year came and they got good crops and they made some money and they come around to the end of that next seven year cycle and, and they did it again and again and again and again and God finally said, okay, 70 years worth of disobedience. You are going to go into captivity where you don't own your own land, where you can't till your own crops, where you can't experience my blessing and everybody is going to go. Not just the bad guys. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord spoken by the mouth of Jeremiah might be accomplished, because Jeremiah had prophesied the last few verses of the book of Jeremiah, that it was going to be 70 years long. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom, and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, All the kingdoms of the earth hath the Lord God of heaven given me, and he hath charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Who is there among you of all his people? The Lord his God be with him, and let him go up. There is a God in heaven who controls the storms in our lives, and there is a God in heaven who brings the blessing at the end of the storm. We have many examples, not just Job, not just Nehemiah, not just the book of Daniel, but the prophets are example. We're told that in James chapter 5, verse 10. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord. Remember, we're talking about suffering for righteousness, not suffering for stupidity and stubbornness and rebellion. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering, affliction, and of patience. If you look back at the Old Testament, the prophets... Which of the Old Testament prophets did they not persecute and kill and cause to suffer? Who had prophesied the coming of the just one, as Paul explains it in the book of Acts. The heroes of faith are also an example, not just the prophets. You know Hebrews 11, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And the first half are all the glorious victories. And then we get down to the last few verses, the heroes of faith who suffered. Starting in verse 36, And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, they were tempted, they were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, totally in poverty, afflicted, tormented. But from God's viewpoint, it wasn't because they were bad. Look what it says. Of whom the world was not worthy. The world didn't deserve to have such incredible godly people. The world was not worthy of them. The ones that the world was cutting in pieces, killing with swords, making them wander around out in the desert in sheepskins and goatskins, goat making them totally poverty stricken. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Have you ever thought about if your house was taken away and you had to run away someplace, where would you go? Do you know any local caves where you could hide out? And all these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. You know, there are many who died in Babylon. Jeremiah had prophesied after 70 years you're going to get to come home. They didn't receive the promise. But some did. God having provided some better thing for us that they without us should not be made perfect. We're getting the blessings and we've had for 200 years plus here in America the blessings of those who've suffered before us, who suffered for righteousness, who fled to this country and established this country because of persecution over in Europe. 
because of the worldliness they saw that was encroaching upon their children and sucking their children into the things of the world and they came here. But you know, the cycle is coming around again. Not only the prophets are our example, not only the heroes of faith are our example, but Jesus himself is our example. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. But we see Jesus. Now he was totally righteous, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. Crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death. For whom does he taste death? Oh, just for the elect. Is that what it says? That he, by the grace of God, should taste death, three words, for every man. We know what he suffered. Matthew 27, 29, 31. When they had platted a crown of thorns, they put it on his head and a reed in his hand, and they bowed the knee before him and mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. He got level one. That mocking business, the scorning, being spit on. After they had mocked him, they took the robe off from him, put his own raiment on him, and led him away to crucify him. He got level two also. Mark, of course, records it, so does Luke. When they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe from him, put on his own clothes, and they led him out to crucify him. Luke 18, 32, he's delivered to the Gentiles, shall be mocked, spitefully entreated, spitted upon. Chapter 22, 63, and the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. Herod and his men of war set him at naught and mocked him and arrayed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him again to Pilate. The soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar. When they had heard of the resurrection of the dead, Paul preached, some mocked him too. He experienced level one. And others said, we will hear thee again of this matter. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen is preaching and he says, And God spake on this wise, that his seed, that is the seed of Abraham, should sojourn in a strange land. That's what we've been talking about in the morning services. And that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. Nobody lived through that entire period of time. Acts 26, 11. Paul is preaching giving account for himself before the leaders and the rulers. I punished them often in every synagogue. Who? The Christians. And compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceeding mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. Do you think that kind of thing is not coming again? One of the most important key passages in the entire New Testament dealing with this issue of predestined storms in our life is 1 Peter chapter 4. If you'll turn over there, we're going to read that passage and talk about it as we go through first Peter chapter 4 remember Jesus is also our example and that's where Peter starts for as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh arm yourselves likewise with the same mind you see it happened to Jesus you are no better than Jesus Jesus suffered in the flesh for us. So get ready. Arm yourselves. That's what a commander tells to those who are getting ready for battle. Can you imagine a, gr a group of Green Berets or a bunch of Navy SEALs who are getting ready for a mission deep into enemy hostile territory? Suppose the, the guys who took out Osama bin Laden. And so the commander says, well, I guess we're going to go do something today, guys. Just hop in the helicopter and everybody doesn't know what's going on. And so uh, uh, they all think, man, we're going for a helicopter ride. And they leave all their weapons behind. And then they come to the drop-off point and the pilot helicopter says, okay, jump out. And they say, wait a minute, we didn't bring our parachute. You didn't bring your parachute? Why didn't you bring your parachute? I thought we were going on a pleasure ride. <laughs> And they get pushed out. You know what happens? They're dead. They get on the ground, the ones that brought their parachute, and they're told, okay, we're going to go take Osama bin Laden. So they knock on the front gate. Say, uh, is Osama bin Laden in here? <laughs> Do you think that's the way it happened? 
Or do you think that they were told, Arm yourselves! Because you're going to suffer in battle. That's the way it is in every war. Now, it tells us something else that's very important to know about the suffering that we as Christians endure. Look at the last phrase of verse 1. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin, that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men, but to the will of God. God looks down at us and he sees the rotten stuff in our hearts. God says, my purpose is to conform that dear child of mine to the image of Jesus. And rotten stuff doesn't belong in the image. So to remove that, I'm going to have to send in some fire that will burn up the rotten stuff so that the gold and silver will be what remains. I'm going to burn the sin out of his life. They that have suffered in the flesh have ceased from sin. That's what God uses to conform us to the image of Christ. Suffering. And it's not just for that moment. It's so that we can focus on how we are to live the rest of our lives that he should no longer this is the purpose that he should no longer live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lusts of men but to the will of God refocuses our attention away from all the garbage of the world away from the things of earth and focuses on our attention on the will of God we don't like to hear that message For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. We used to live like the pagans around us. When we walk in lasciviousness, that shameless immorality, lusts, excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. You used to live that way? You know when you change what's going to happen? He tells you in the next verse. Wherein they think it's strange. That is all those pagans you used to hang out with. They think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riot speaking evil of you. You know what they're going to do? Level one, what is it? Mocking you. Level one, what is it? They mock you. They talk about you. They say evil things about you. They say how you've become a, a religious weirdo and a fanatic. That's what he's talking about there. But he says, don't worry about it. Who shall give an account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. God will take care of them in his time. Your job is to pay attention to you. For for this cause was the gospel preached also to them that are dead, that they might be judged according to men in the flesh, but live according to God in the spirit. But the end of all things is at hand. You think we're moving down toward the end times? Peter believes so. Every generation of Christians has believed so. It certainly looks so right now in our world. The world has never been quite like this before, except as in the days of Noah when God did send his judgment. The end of all things is at hand. Be you therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Mm. Be sober-minded. Watch unto prayer. Watch means to stand guard. And what you're supposed to be doing while you're standing guard, you pray like crazy. That's what Paul talks about when he talks about putting on the armor in Ephesians chapter 6. What does he end with? He says, praying always with all prayer and supplication. That's how we're supposed to be armed, ready for battle, and praying like crazy. But you're supposed to be doing something practical too. Verse 8. Above all things, have fervent charity among yourselves. That's the agape love that's described in 1 Corinthians 13. For charity shall cover a multitude of sins. Use hospitality one to another without grudging. They needed it because a lot of them had been thrown out of their homes. 
Every man has received the gift, so minister the same one to another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. If any man speak, let him speak as of the oracles of God. If any man minister, he's talking about exercising the spiritual gifts in times of suffering. In times of personal suffering. Not focusing on yourself. What was the context immediately before? We're going to see it's the context immediately following. He's talking about exercising the spiritual gifts when you yourself are going through the horrible times of trouble. Let him do it as if the ability which God giveth that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. And then he goes back to suffering. He started with suffering. He says, here's how you're supposed to be acting when you yourself are going through suffering. He started with suffering and then he says, here's how you're supposed to respond. Here's how you're supposed to act. Don't be like the children of Israel when they got there to the edge of the Red Sea and they panicked. Instead, allow this to be a time where sin is cleansed out of your life. Instead, let this be a time where your focus is refocused on eternal things rather than on temporal things. Instead of complaining, let this be a time when you're suffering of ministering to the body of Christ with the gifts that God has given to you. Three things that we're supposed to be doing as we go through suffering. And then he goes back to talking about suffering. Don't think it's weird when it happens to you for righteousness. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. Why is this happening? That was Job's complaint. Lord, I've lived the very best I possibly can. And God himself said Job was righteous. But God has many purposes in our lives. He was demonstrating through Job that Job truly trusted him. Don't think it's strange concerning the fiery trial. The fire burns out the dross, which is to try you as though some strange thing. This is really weird. Why is this happening to me? Some strange thing happened unto you. Here's the next attitude we're supposed to have. Verse 13. But rejoice. You know, it's rather interesting. I did a study many years ago on all the times that joy and rejoicing show up in the Bible. And within the context someplace, there's always something that related to suffering. Happiness is based on happenings, happenstance. It's based on the God Hap, H-A-P, where things are going well and that, that's because, that, because of that you're happy. Joy is something that is clearly manifested in the life of a believer in contrast to the world because the believer's joy shines the very brightest when the things are the very darkest you're suffering here's how to respond rejoice and it goes back to our chief example inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Not the way the world looks at it, is it? What about that first little, if you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. On their part he is evil spoken of, on your part he's glorified. And here we have the reasons you're not supposed to suffer. We talked about that, the stupidity. Let none of you suffer as a murderer, or as a thief, or as an evildoer, or as a, a busybody in other men's matters. You know, you can say, oh, I'm not a murderer, I'm not a thief, I'm not an evildoer. Have you ever been a busybody? Poking around, trying to find out dirt on some other Christian so you could gossip about it and chuckle and laugh? Curious as to what's going on? Busy poking into other men's matters or other ladies' matters? Don't suffer for that. 
Verse 16. Here's the kind of suffering we're talking about. Predestined storms in our lives. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. For the time has come, the judgment must begin at the house of God. What did we just read back there in Chronicles? Judgment came in the house of God in Jerusalem was destroyed. And even the good people of God's people were taken into captivity and suffered along with the bad people. God was going to rebuild, but it was going to take 70 years because there was a habitual sin that everybody in the land had been participating in, not allowing the land to have its Sabbath every seven years. And if it first begin at us, what shall be the end of them that obey not the gospel of God? That's serious business. Verse 18, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? And then the key verse, verse 19. Wherefore, let them that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. He takes you back to the fact that God is the creator. Nothing can happen apart from the one who made everything with the word of his mouth. Do you not think he can take care of your soul? Are you not suffering according to the will of God? Those are the predestined storms in our lives. I'll leave you with two verses. 1 Peter 3.17, the immediate preceding chapter. We've just read all of chapter 4. He talked about it though in chapter 3. Are you suffering? For it is better if the will of God be so, that you suffer for well-doing than for evil-doing. And finally, Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36. For ye have need of patience, that after ye have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Israel had to spend time in Egypt and go through the suffering before they received God's blessing of deliverance. The Apostle Paul had to be on a boat where they went through terror and suffering before they were delivered and suddenly not just Paul was delivered but those who watched the Apostle Paul those who heard his words those who responded and we see that by the way in which they responded the chief captain responding the soldiers responding the people responding heading in towards shore and every one of them even those who couldn't swim made it ashore on broken pieces of the ship people are watching us how do we respond when God in his wisdom and in his design to burn out the sludge that's in our lives what do they see do we rejoice do we think it's strange when we're approached for the name of Christ do we realize that the spirit of glory and of God is resting upon us when we suffer as a Christian are we ashamed or are we unashamed and glorify God on that behalf. When we suffer according to the will of God, do we commend our souls unto him in well-doing, doing what's right, exercising the gifts as Peter talks about in chapter 4, as unto a faithful creator. Because after we have done the will of God, we will receive the promise. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you once again for your word and for its power. 
There's so much in it, so many examples. Take my brethren, the prophets, for an example of suffering. Our Lord Jesus Christ as our example of suffering. Early believers in the church and how they responded, ministering one to another in their own personal times of suffering, exercising their gifts and providing for the needs of brethren. Father, we don't know the specifics of what is coming in our country or in our personal lives, but we know that you allow suffering because you're conforming us to the image of Christ. Help us, Father, to be joyful in it because you are a good God, because we know that you love us and we know that you work all things according to the counsel of your will. And Father, for that we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn tonight is number 140, Will Jesus 